Okay, we are in uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 22 today, and the conversion of Saul of Tar Tarsus, son of Shem. Now, I want to go back last week. I had several people, because we had a break with a missionary thing, and they missed part of what I said at the very beginning, and I'm going to just re-clarify that because of the confusion. Here's what I said last week at the beginning, and I'll repeat it. In chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Acts, we find a record of three remarkable conversions. Chapter 8 gives the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, a son of Ham. Chapter 9 gives the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, a son of Shem. Chapter 10 gives the conversion of Cornelius, a Roman centurion, a son of Jacob. The entire human family came from the three sons of Noah. Therefore, we can conclude that God is communicating to us that the gospel is for all, everyone, everywhere. John 3, 16, Acts 1, 8, and Revelation chapter 7, it talks about people from all tribes, tongues, and nations are before the throne of God. And I also said last week, by the way, it's interesting to me, and it's trivia, but the three sons of Noah are always called, first of all, in this order, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, right? That's not their birth order. Interesting. What it tells me is the second, the second conversion or the second new life is the most important. Not the birth order, it's kind of the reverse. Just a trivia thing, but uh, I thought I'd share with you. We also said from these three examples that a conversion, three factors come into play before someone is converted, if you remember. The work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the man or woman of God. We're going to look at that again today as we see the conversion of Saul son of Shem. And uh, one other thing of clarification I need to do from last week, I mentioned that uh, the son of Ham, the first one converted, was an Ethiopian, if you remember, and he went back and uh, spread the gospel there in Ethiopia. And I said that Ethiopia was the only Christian nation in Africa, majority Christian. That was only I guess you could say partially true because there are other nations that are majority Christian, but they're predominantly Catholic. It's the only nation that is predominantly Protestant and Orthodox. So I wanted to make that distinction as well. Okay. Chapter 9, which we're in today, gives the conversion of one of the greatest enemies of the church, who many believe became the greatest missionary, the greatest theologian, the greatest writer of scripture, I'm gonna just say New Testament scripture, who ever lived. Now, the reason I excluded the Old Testament, you know, Moses was up there too, and Abraham and Daniel, there's some great writers, but in the New Testament, isn't that just like God? He takes the worst enemy of the church and makes him the greatest missionary, the greatest theologian. He's going to do that with Israel also. Today, less than 2% of Israel, I think even globally, because there's more Jews outside of Israel than there is in, are Christian. He's going to take that nation and make them the greatest witnesses that ever came on this earth, during the tribulation period, Revelation chapter 7, there's going to be 144,000 Jews that are witnesses on this earth. They'll be the greatest witnesses there ever was, just like God. So let's look first of all at Saul's pursuit of Christians in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 9. It says... Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest 
and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound uh, to, to Jerusalem. Earlier, the scripture indicated that Saul supported the plot to arrest, convict, and stone Stephen. Remember, they laid his clothes at Paul's feet. He was probably the leader of the pack. So, I said, Paul, I gotta stay with Saul. He's not changed his name yet. Saul's persecution of the church may have lasted as long as three years, according to the history books. That's a long time. After many of the believers left Jerusalem and were scattered, the Sanhedrin seemed to be somewhat satisfied. This movement had waned, but not Saul. He wanted to weed them out wherever they had gone, wherever they were, he was after them. Note also what it calls, what we call Christianity today, it was the way. That's what it was until way later on in Christianity when they were first called Christians at Antioch, if you remember. It was the way. So where did that come from? Well, you remember Jesus' words? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It may have come from that, or it may have just been a way, but I choose to believe it came from Jesus. Any of you remember Jack Hafer? What was his name of his church? Church on the Way. <laughs> great man of God, and a great name, I think, for Christianity, obviously, it just means, a Christian simply means little Christ. That's good, too. Okay, Jesus speaks from heaven, verses 3 and 4. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now Damascus was a sizable city, and it was in Syria, 140 miles north of Jerusalem. So it was at least a six-day journey by foot or horseback. The context indicates that there were no more than a day's journey from Damascus when a bright light surrounded them, and it says, suddenly. And the light appeared like a beam from heaven with intensive light. In fact, later on in his testimony, if you remember, he says it was around noon when this light happened. So it had to be a super bright light. And the wording in the Greek indicates it was like a beam from heaven on them. It said it outshone the sun. Now, if you look back in the Old Testament, there was what was called the Shekinah glory, if you remember that. It first came in the form of the burning bush, the Shekinah glory, lit that on fire, and then it was the Jews were led by the Shekinah glory cloud in the sky, wherever they went, it led them there. And then it settled on Mount Sinai. But on later on, where they received uh, the law and the commandments. But later on, if you remember when they built, uh, the tabernacle was built, the Shekinah glory came down, indicating the presence of God in that tabernacle. And then when the temple was built, it came down again upon the temple, indicating the presence of God. So Saul, being an expert in the Old Testament, may have thought, aha, what is this here shining upon me? It says he fell to the ground and heard a voice indicating him, indicting him for persecuting, he says, me. Well, how was he persecuting me, Jesus? That's me. Well, who is his body? It's the church. And when you persecute the church, anyone in church body, you're persecuting Jesus. Now, let's look at the name Jesus in verses 5 and 6. And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus. Saul must have thought, Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Whom you are persecuting. 
It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what would you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Paul says, Who are you, Lord? Now this word Lord here is curious. It could be either sir or it could mean God. The Jews used it to mean God. And at this time, Saul wasn't quite sure who he was talking to, except he knew he was talking to Jesus because he said, I am Jesus. But he knew this was obviously supernatural. Now, I've always wondered this kick against the goats. That's not a term we use. So what does that mean? And I had seldom hear it explained. Well, here's what it means. It means an exercise in futility. It also, the Greeks and the Romans used it this way, ruinous resistance. In other words, what, what you're doing isn't going to work. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just kept charging when nothing is happening? Where you try to kick the door down, but it doesn't go down, and you just keep doing it? That's what he was doing. Jesus instructed Saul to continue his journey to Damascus with a different agenda, which he would disclose later. So the posse loses its leader in verses 7 through 9. It says, And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. It's a long time to be in the darkness. It says the men with Saul saw no one, or heard the sound of a voice. It says later on, they didn't know what it said. They didn't understand anything he said, but they heard the sound. Saul, on the other hand, understood the message from the risen Christ, but he was literally blinded by the light, so that he had to be led to Damascus by his companions, where he sat in his own personal darkness for three days. I believe this is a picture of spiritual darkness as well as physical darkness. Some of you who may have been saved as an adult can look back and see when and realize you were in spiritual darkness before. I was saved when I was eight years old, so I don't remember a lot of what happened before. All I remember is I was certainly relieved. But spiritual darkness is something that some of you may be able to understand. Certainly Tony, who was saved as an adult, obviously understands that. So both Ananias and Saul have a vision. By the way, I think you know that uh, there's several ways that God spoke to his people in the Old Testament and somewhat, somewhat in the New Testament as well, and they were dreams and visions. And you know the difference is a dream, you can't talk back. You ever tried to talk back to somebody in a dream? It doesn't work. Your mind just can't get there. You want to say to them, if it's a scary dream, stop. You can't even hardly say that. So it's a one-way conversation, but in a vision, it can be a two-way, it's just not always, but it can be a two-way conversation. We're going to see that later with Peter and Cornelius. <clears throat> Verses 10 through 16. Did I read? No, 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 no. i got to go back to verse 17. I... <laughs> I, will, I will catch up don't worry I was on the wrong page now verse 10 now there was a certain disciple at, at Damascus named Ananias uh, I think someone asked me earlier have you noticed how many people in the Bible are named Simon and how many people are named Ananias I think Ty mentioned a week or two ago they didn't they must have run out of names, but you know, there's a lot of Bobs and Johns and uh, Todays. So it's not that unusual. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here am I. See, there's a two-way conversation. 
So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. Remember, he's still in the dark. He's praying. And in vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Meanwhile, across town, the Lord had prepared a devout man, Ananias, who God gave the name and address of the house where Saul had waited. He's very specific. God, he, he is so plain and specific here, he wants to make sure they get it right. And assured him Saul knew he was coming. All Saul had to do was get up and go. Verse 11. I don't know if you've ever had a message from God to go talk to someone. And it was just very clear. I have. And you get up and go. Whether you're successful or not at that moment, it doesn't matter. You get up and go. Maybe it's successful later. And of course, there was concern on Ammonite's part. This guy was a fierce enemy of the way. But Jesus said, seek out the man and lay hands on him. Ananias, he, re he really wasn't refusing. He just wanted to understand what this is all about. Am I, is my life in danger? You know, I've noticed the Lord doesn't always explain himself. Lord, can you be a little clearer on that? You know, I want to get it right. So... Tell me exactly what you want me to do. He says, go. <laughs> so if he says, go, I use two words, and I love this song, trust and obey. That's what you do. But the Lord emphasized his sovereign choice of Saul. He said, he's a chosen vessel of mine. By the way, I think you know each of you are a chosen vessel of the Lord. You may not be chosen for this mission, but it says in Ephesians 1, 4, we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. It also says your names were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Now, I don't understand our side of the equation. I like what Spurgeon says, and I've said it before. I'm glad he chose me before I was born, but he certainly wouldn't have chosen me after I was born. <laughs> he also told Ananias his purpose for Saul in verse 15 and 16. This is amazing. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. If when you came to Christ, he said, I'm going to show you how much you're going to suffer for me, would you have said, yes, bring it on? <laughs> you might have said, wait a minute, let me think this over a little bit before I jump in here. But if you remember, suffering is one of the two bags that God puts all of the rewards in heaven in. The other one is faithfulness and suffering for the cause of Christ. So... You're talking about eternity versus a little bit of suffering here. I've always told the Lord, and I've said this before, I don't suffer well, so fill up the other bag for me. Help me to be faithful, but he will do whatever he wishes to do. Here's what I do know about election and predestination. Remember Jesus, even though he knew, when the rich young ruler came to him, and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, you know the law. And he described it to him. He says, all those I've kept from my, when I was a little boy. He said, well, then go and sell all you have and give it to the poor. Uh-oh. <laughs> and he went away sadly. And he says, Jesus was sad too when he went away. 
Jesus knew he wasn't coming to the Lord, but he still tried to convince him. And the other one is Judas. If you remember Judas, the betrayer of Christ, Jesus was reaching out to him to the very end. So therefore, even though Jesus knew he was predestined, or not predestined, he still was reaching out to him. That's a lesson for us. If Jesus did it, we should do it as well. So Saul regains his sight and is baptized in verses 17 through 19. It says, And Ananias went on his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. I have a question when I read this. You remember I'm a person full of questions. When I read scripture, I write down insights and questions. I try to answer my own questions. But I have a question and a statement. When was Saul converted? On the road to Damascus or in Judah's house? Anyone want to take a shot? There's a clue in verse 17. Look back at verse 17, you'll find a clue. says, Brother Saul. He walked in the house and he says, Brother Saul. He was already a member of the family of God. That's a, he, call, he wouldn't have called him Brother Saul. He would have said, get down on your knees. We're going to work this thing out. And Brother Saul, he was already saved and baptized by the Holy Spirit. Remember when you receive Christ, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit on the road. The second clue here is Jesus said he is praying. This is before he got there. I learned something this week in reading a book by Harry H.A. Ironside. He said, that did you know we are not told anywhere in the Bible that you have to pray to be saved? It says you have to believe to be saved. Now, I looked I didn't believe this either, so I, I went down the Roman road and I said, now wait a minute, I'm supposed to get down on my knees, confess my sins in order to be saved. The Roman road doesn't say that. If you go down the Roman road, it says, first of all, Romans 3.23, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. It says that uh, the wages of sin is death, and it goes on and says, you must confess your, with your mouth and believe in your heart and it doesn't say anything about praying, even though I'm not saying it's wrong. It just says we are to believe. You pray because you're, you believe. Because prayers before you believe are prayers to what? Prayer and faith are interchangeable, I believe. If you pray, you pray because you believe. So prayer warriors are faith warriors. They're interchangeable. Now a statement. I made last week, and I made it again at the beginning, it takes the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and a man or woman of God to come together in order to be saved. Okay, what about Saul? Where was the man of God? The Spirit of God obviously was there because he was saved. What about the Word of God? Okay? I present to you the man of God was Stephen. I didn't say he had to be present. Remember, he was there when Stephen was stoned. And remember when Stephen looked up into heaven? Chapter 7, verses 56 and 60. Let me go back and pick that up. It said, And Stephen said, Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Saul probably looked up there and said, I don't see anything. 
And then it says in verse 60, then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And he fell asleep. He was praying for Saul as well as the others. So, the man of God was Stephen. Okay, what about the Word of God? Saul was filled with the Word of God. He had ha half of the Old Testament memorized. He knew Isaiah 53. He was just in spiritual darkness. He didn't understand it. So all of the scriptures he had all of a sudden came to light. In his mind, he realized what they meant. So the Word of God was present. The man of God, hey, he had seen just before this. And of course, we know the Spirit of God was there. You know, I thought about when I was putting this together, I thought about uh, John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. His life was a mess. The guy, his mother had tried to pound the gospel into him, but it was a mess. He went on to be a slave trader, and when he was at his wit's end at the bottom of a slave boat, he looked up and saw a light. That's all he could see from the bottom of that boat. And he cried out to God to save him. So he was by himself. What about the Word of God? His mother had pounded the Word of God into him. It was there. He probably knew a lot of those verses by heart. We know the Spirit of God was there. So his mother was that. So you don't have to be present. I'm just saying the man or woman of God, it takes the Spirit of God and the Word of God all coming together in this one place. There's a song the choir is saying many times, I love this song. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Remember the beginning of the song? I dreamed I went to heaven and I saw all these people. They were coming up and thanking me and I, I what are they thanking for? Thank you for giving to me the message of the gospel. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. And you say, I don't remember that. Maybe you weren't there, but you planted the seed so later they came to the Lord. Okay, to sum up Saul's conversion. Number one, he was saved and baptized by the Holy Spirit on the road to Damascus. Number two, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, it says here, for service. You're baptized when you're saved, you're filled with the Holy Spirit for service. In Judah's house, and Ananias identified himself with Saul by laying on his hands. The message of salvation in verses 20 through 22. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Now a new Christian would probably never do this. They wouldn't know enough. Remember Saul knew all about this. It just wasn't, he was spiritual minded to it. So he could. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is not this one who destroyed those who called on this name? And Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. The message of salvation. What is it? The message of the gospel. Well, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the message of the gospel is you have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? But let me say this. You must first believe that he is the Son of God. If you don't believe he's God, then nothing else matters. That's the first thing you need to believe. I remember Tony saying, uh, after she was saved, she was Christian science before. Well, of course Jesus is God. Well, Christian science don't teach that. She had been taught all her life that he wasn't. He is the Son of God as well, let me add this, as God the Son. Now, Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus is a God, that God the Father created the Son, but he's not God the Son. Mormons believe that Jesus was the brother of Lucifer, believe it or not, before Lucifer fell, and God the Father chose Jesus to go die for the sins of the world rather than Lucifer, and they gave 
Lucifer off the hook, that's why he fell. I chose my brother. So, how was Saul able to immediately preach Christ all of this, all of a sudden, he was a scholar in the Old Testament. Once the scales were off his eyes, that was symbolic that he was no longer spiritually blind. There were some 300 prophecies in the Old Testament, and he probably had them memorized, saying that Jesus was going to be the Messiah and was going to come. He knew that, and all of a sudden the light came on. Jesus was and is the Messiah of God. Well, in closing, got to make sure I'm doing okay. It's not just about getting people saved, it's about discipleship. Remember, Saul immediately started preaching Christ. It was, you know, you can leave spiritual babies on the doorstep and they'll starve to death. You need to make sure that they are schooled and disciple. Saul had questions at the very beginning. and Ananias had answers. He was his brother in Christ. And he gave him the first baby steps. He also introduced Saul to a community of believers. That's the church. So he was now in training, even though he, had, he was a great scholar before, he still needed to be trained as a disciple. And even though he preached immediately, Galatians 1.17 says this about Saul. It says he left Damascus and spent three years in Arabia. What was he doing in Arabia? He's being schooled and trained by the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the disciples walked with Jesus three years? He was the greatest of the apostles. I believe he was with Jesus in that desert for three years. And reproduction. Saul the Pharisee became Saul the, the Apostle, and his testimony became the basis of a worldwide evangelism. We're going to see his testimony repeated over and over in the book of Acts, and he puts a little different slant each time. So we learn something about what he saw on the road to Damascus and afterwards from his testimony. 